Good morning. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to this Lord's Day worship of God. Special welcome to each of you. Um, as I am sharing announcements, would you please make use of the Ministry of Friendship pew pad? Those of you closest to the aisle will find it beside you. Please pick it up, provide the information requested, and share it with your neighbor beside whom you're worshiping this morning. Um, there are numerous announcements in the bulletin, and you can uh, uh, read those for yourselves. Someone did ask me about the photograph on the cover. Um, if you're not familiar with Doroth Dorothea Lang, a very famous uh, uh, Depression-era American photographer who worked for the Farm Services Administration to document you know, the change in American society, primarily the migration of a great number of people from Oklahoma to California. So that's uh, her migrant mother uh, portrait on the cover. I do want to call uh, attention to a concert that's available in our community this afternoon at the Museum of the Shenandoah Valley at 2 p.m. So if you don't know what to do with the woman in your life for this afternoon, you may want to go to the concert. It's our own Jackson Caesar, and I'm looking for him. I can't, he's, he's, he's behind the podium there. And, uh, uh, but Jackson will be in concert doing uh, uh, songs of love on, on this uh, May Sunday. So 2 o'clock today at the Museum of the Shenandoah Valley. Are there additional announcements that require our attention this morning? If not, let us uh, join our hearts and our minds to worship the living God.
Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. His name is wonderful. There's just something about that name. His name is wonderful, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about Let us now join together in the responsive call to worship. Welcome home. God bids us return. Find rest for our weariness. Find peace to be our courage. Welcome home. All we lost wandering into stark and despair. Welcome. Let us pray. Grant unto us, O God, the fullness of your promises. Where we have been weak, grant us your strength. Where we have been confused, grant us your guidance. Where we have been distraught, grant us your comfort. Where we have been dead, grant us your life. Apart from you, O Lord, we are nothing. In and with you, we can do all things. Amen.
The proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray together. Faithful God, patient friend, you are as near to us as breath and as constant as the waves on the shore. Yet how often our lives fail to mirror your ways. We are sometimes absent from our children, giving in to pressures at work or yielding to the lure of success and money. We are at times distant from one another, for though we are in the same place, our hearts and minds wander and stray. We choose not to listen, to only half hear the words of another. Faithful God, patient friend, restore our sense of belonging to each other. Heal our relationships and encourage us to be caring fathers, strong mothers, and wise friends. Teach us the way of love and the path of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. And so friends, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Be seated, please. At this time, I would like to invite uh, young children to come forward for the children's moment. sit right here where you can see because this morning I want to tell you about a lady named Hannah and so Hannah really wanted to be a mom but she didn't have any children and that made Hannah sad then to make things even harder for Hannah there was another lady who had lots of children named Penina, and she would make fun of Hannah just because she didn't have any kids. And that made Hannah even more sad. Hannah was made fun of so much by Penina that she would cry and not eat. Hannah was in a tough situation, and Hannah needed help. But Hannah knew the best thing that she could ever do when she was in a tough situation. Hannah knew that she could pray and that she could ask God to help her, and that's exactly what Hannah did. Hannah prayed to God, 
and God heard Hannah's prayer, and God blessed Hannah um, with many children, including her first son Samuel and others um, who went on to do great things for God. So sometimes we might be in tough situations. Your tough situations would probably be a lot different than Hannah's. Um, someone might be treating you badly. Um, someone close to you might be really sick. Um, you might be feeling scared in, in a difficult situation, but we can learn from Hannah if we can remember to be like Hannah and to pray when we're in a tough situation. And we know that God loves us and that God will hear our prayer and that God will answer our prayer in the way that God knows is best. All right. So um, just like Hannah, we don't ever have to feel alone when we face hard times because God is with us and we can pray, all right? Um, so kids and congregation, if you would join us um, in a word of prayer. Dear God, help us remember that you hear us when we pray. Help us always turn to you in prayer when we face hard times. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you all very much for coming up this morning. The children may return to their families or go out to We One's worship, and as they are doing that, let us take a few moments to greet the people around us. God gives us those who love us to help us on our way. God gives us those who love us to love us come what may. God gives us those who love us that we may love them too. gives us those who love us, who give us life at birth. God gives us those who love us to care for us on earth. God gives us those who love us to show what love can be, to show gives us those who love us, our families and friends. God gives us those who love us, whose love both guides and mends. God gives us those who love us to teach us love's reward, to teach us love. Reward. God gives us those who love us because God loves us too. God gives us those who love us to show what love can do. God gives us those who love us the greatest love of all, the greatest love of all, the greatest.
During the month of May, uh, we are exploring from the pulpit uh, prayer, the discipline of prayer. Last uh, Sunday, we looked at uh, the prayer that Jesus gave to us to be the model for our prayer. Today, we are looking at a different prayer uh, that belongs uniquely to a particular woman in a particular circumstance, um, namely Hannah and her childlessness. The lesson is 1 Samuel, the first chapter, reading verses uh, 1 through 20 and then 24 through 28. Hear now the word of God. There was a certain man of Ramathiam, a Zephite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina, Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. She brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me the petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. She left him there for the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God.
I don't know this for sure, but I strongly suspect that God and a lot of mothers may be in cahoots with one another to get each and every one of us where we need to be in life. You know, one of the more famous God and mother partnerships is the one involving Monica, the mother of Augustine, who would go on to become one of the most significant theologians in the Christian tradition and a canonized saint. Augustine deeply influenced Martin Luther and John Calvin, two of the principal 16th century Protestant reformers. Now, Monica could not have known any of this. She simply wanted her son out of the bars and out of the brothels and in church and deployed prayer as a means toward her goal. Monica was purported to have been a deeply devout woman. She wept and prayed daily for her brilliant but wayward son, Augustine. Monica's prayers and pleadings resulted in an association between Ambrose, the Archbishop of Milan, and Augustine. Augustine's relationship to Ambrose contributed to his conversion to Christianity in his early 30s in the year 386. And in the Roman Catholic tradition, Monica is venerated as a saint for her Christian virtues and her prayerful life dedicated to the reformation of her son, Augustine. Today in our lesson from 1 Samuel 1, we meet another prayerful woman, Hannah. First, a little about the books of Samuel. In the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, Samuel is only one book. In the Christian Old Testament, uh, it's two books, same material. Now, Samuel does not travel well from the 11th century B.C. into the 21st century, our era. The books of Samuel are set in very ancient Israel, namely the last years of the tribal confederacy prior to the beginning of the monarchy with the reign of Saul in the year 1020 B.C. That's 3,000 years ago. There's a lot going on in 1 Samuel 1, and much of it, if not most of it, is foreign to us. There is polygamy. There is animal sacrifice. There is infertility that is attributed to God. There is bargaining with God. If you do this for me, then I will do that for you. There is a disinterested and disengaged priest. There is family strife on a colossal scale. To begin with, we need a program in order to keep track of the cast of characters. There is Elkanah, who is the family patriarch. He has two wives, Penina, who bore him many sons and daughters, and Hannah, who was barren and bore him no sons and no daughters. Many sons and daughters were necessary. They were one's security in advanced years. Elkanah played favorites. He loved Hannah more than Penina, and Penina made Hannah pay dearly for it. Penina taunted Hannah and ridiculed her for her childlessness. The culture and society of the books of Samuel valued women only for their ability to conceive and bear children. A woman who was unable to do so was undervalued, underappreciated. A woman unwilling to do so was unheard of. Despite Elkanah's love for Hannah, evidently it did not include stepping in and shielding her from Penina's sharp tongue. Annually, the books tell us Elkanah and his family would go to Shiloh, that's Israel's central pre-Jerusalem, pre-temple shrine, and home of the Ark of the Covenant, which held the stone tablets upon which God inscribed the Ten Commandments. At Shiloh, they would offer animal sacrifices to God and feast on the sacrificed animal. Penina used these occasions of prolonged family togetherness to further provoke Hannah and reduce her 
to tears. One particular year, Hannah presented herself to the shrine's priest, Eli, and prayed. Eli saw Hannah's lips moving but did not hear her voice. He assumed she was drunk. Hannah assured him that she wasn't. If she appeared to be drunk, it was because she was so deeply troubled and had been pouring out her very heart and soul to God in silent prayer. Eli, who lacked the competence or the interest to tell the difference between someone who was drunk and someone who was troubled, nonetheless blesses Hannah in God's name. Go in peace, he tells her. The God of Israel, grant the petition you have made to him. And the narrator of the account tells us that in due time, the narrator doesn't tell us how much or little time passed, Hannah conceived and bore Elkanah a son and named him Samuel. And after Samuel was weaned, his mother Hannah presented him to God at Shiloh, where he grew up in the shrine and served the priest Eli. Samuel is a big deal in Israel's history. He is the last of the judges. He is the first of the major prophets. He anoints Israel's first two kings, Saul and David. 1 Samuel 1 is a nativity story. It's a birth narrative. It tells us about Samuel's beginnings. Luke draws upon the story in telling the story of Jesus' birth in his gospel. Samuel's origin is the result of a barren mother's fervent prayer and God's favor. Last week we looked at the Lord's Prayer which Jesus gave to us as a model for our prayer. Today we look at a prayer that is very different. It is not a prayer given by a master to his disciples to model their own prayers after. Rather, it is a prayer that belongs uniquely to one person, Hannah, and uniquely to her situation, childlessness. And still, there is something for us to learn. Hannah's prayer for a child is uniquely hers. Her childlessness culturally estranged her. Her childlessness diminished her self-worth to no end. A child was her destiny. She could not bear to move into a future without fulfilling that destiny. So Hannah prayed. She bargained, God, give me the one thing that will allow me to join the company of other women in my culture and my society. God, give me the one thing that will validate my very existence as a woman in my culture and society and in my own eyes. God, give me the one thing that will fulfill my destiny. And Hannah's one thing was a son. And if you do, Hannah says, Hannah prays, I will give him back to you. Now on the surface, Hannah's prayer, despite ending very selflessly, strikes me as selfish. Maybe I'm reading something into the story that isn't really there, but I hear selfishness. Her reasons for praying for a son come across as being primarily for her sake. A son will end her estrangement. A son will validate her womanhood. A son will fulfill her destiny. These are all questionable motives for bringing a child into the world. Perhaps Hannah's prayer strikes me as selfish because I know what it means to pray selfish prayers. I think we all know what it means to pray selfish prayers. God, give me this. God, give me that. A selfish prayer is how and where many of us begin our praying lives. It is certainly how and where I began my praying life. But hopefully 
we don't stay there. It is a dangerous thing to judge the motivations of others when it comes to prayer. As a man, I can't begin to know what it may have been like to have been a woman in Hannah's culture and society who could not conceive and bear a child. As a pastor, I have sat with and heard the anguishing stories of young women in my congregations over the years who longed to conceive and bear a child but could not, even after lengthy and expensive fertility treatments. Their tears and their prayers were no less fervent than Hannah's. They were equally vexed and troubled by their childlessness. Their prayers did not strike me as selfish at all. Rather, they struck me as human. And that's what Hannah's prayer is. It's human. Hannah was plagued by childlessness. Although it might not be our life's concern, it was certainly her life's concern. It consumed her. It left her estranged. A barren woman in her culture was a misfit, an outcast, an oddity, a curse. It was that one thing that stood between her and fulfillment. It was that one thing she wanted and needed more than anything else to validate her life and without which she wasn't sure what her life was worth. At various seasons of our lives, we will have a concern that will plague us. We will have a concern that will consume us so what was Hannah to do? What could Hannah do? She cried. She wept. She sobbed. She wailed. She prayed. She asked God to look on her misery. She asked God to remember her. She asked God not to forget her. She asked God for a son. Anna, Hannah poured out all of her trouble, all of her anxiety, all of her vexation to God in prayer. You know, I can imagine a loop of haunting questions running through Hannah's mind regularly. My God, what did I do to deserve this? What is wrong with me? Why won't you help me? Please. Hannah didn't exactly know what God would do with her prayer. She didn't know exactly what God would do with her misery and her trouble and her anxiety and her vexation and her longing for a son, but Hannah trusted. She had faith that her prayer was making its way to heaven and to the heart of God and that God would do something because God was God and God loved her. I understand Hannah here. I don't know what God will do with my prayers other than answer them in God's way and in God's time. I know what I would like for God to do with my prayers, namely to answer them exactly as I've instructed God to do so. It doesn't work that way. But like Hannah, I trust that my prayer makes it to heaven, to God's heart, and that God will do something. And that something will be good even if through tears and under the weight of a broken heart, I can't see it. Because God is God and God loves me. God is God and God loves you. That's what this faith stuff is all about. A number of years ago in another congregation, I was having a pastoral conversation with someone, and this person was hurting, really hurting. Despite the hurt, she never stopped praying. But she discovered that she was saying things to God she had never said to God before. 
Her words expressed anger and desperation, agony and hopelessness. Her words surprised her. Some of her words were vulgar and profane, but she kept saying them to God. And she wanted to know if she could say to God the kinds of things she was saying to God. And I kept listening. And in the course of the conversation, she answered her own question. It occurred to her that if you can't say anything and everything to God, then who can you say anything and everything to? And if God doesn't know what to do with a broken heart, then who is going to know what to do with a broken heart? The woman's story and Hannah's story are similar. Hannah's husband, Elkanah, was of little help. He comes across as self-absorbed. Wasn't he enough? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Penina, Elkanah's other wife, was no help but only made matters worse. She delighted in salting Hannah's wounds. And Eli, the priest at Shiloh, was oblivious. He accused her of being drunk. Hannah had no one to sympathize with her, much less empathize with her. She didn't know what to do with her intentions, her motivations, her aspirations. Back to the woman I mentioned earlier. I will always remember what she told me in the course of our conversation. She said, life has taught me how to pray. And in an odd sort of way, I'm grateful, though at the time initially I wasn't. I have become more real to myself, and God has become more real to me. Life taught Hannah to pray. Life teaches us to pray. The things that lie beyond our control will always outnumber the things that we can control. That reality alone will teach us how to pray. Hannah's prayer still comes across to me as rather selfish, but it is mostly raw and human. Hannah wanted a son, and in her case, God gave her that son, but as it turns out, God and the son also gave Israel a judge, Israel a prophet, Israel an anointer of kings. And this part of the story amazes me every time I read it. It's as if the writer of the books of Samuel wants us to see what God can and will do with a raw, human, and even selfish prayer. God can take those words and do with them things beyond our wildest dreams and imaginations. Hannah wasn't praying to God to raise a leader for Israel. She wanted a little boy. The world got both because of God's favor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It's now our privilege to go before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we give you thanks that we can come before you in prayer, bringing our selfish wants and desires before you, knowing that you will hear us even when we scream, even when we shout, even when we cry. We are grateful, Lord, that even when we are unsure of our words, we know that your spirit intercedes for us and our words will be good and they will be heard by you. O oh Lord, this day, as we honor mothers, we give thanks for those moments in our relationships with our mothers or our children 
that give us a glimpse of your love, how you love us, and we give thanks. And, O oh Lord, in those moments in our relationships with our children or our mothers that are painful and hurtful and broken, O oh Lord, we pray for your healing and we pray for forgiveness. O oh Lord, this day we pray for your world, giving thanks for your good creation, giving thanks for the beauty of the world you created and how it points a finger to you everywhere we look. Grateful that spring reminds us of how Jesus was resurrected and gives us new life. The world has come alive again and death is no more. Oh Lord, this day we do pray for your world, for it is groaning. We pray, O oh Lord, for those places of unrest where there is no peace, places where children are in danger. We play, pray for Nigeria um, as they struggle to find their girls. But remembering, even as several hundred are missing, there are millions others around the world who are enslaved and trafficked every day. And so, Lord, we pray for those children. We pray, O oh Lord, for Ukraine and pray for peace and for justice, that there would be a way forward that would give you glory and that would surprise us all. We pray, O oh Lord, for our nation, for our leaders, for our community. Lord, that we would seek your way of peace and justice so that no one is hungry and everyone has a place to live. Lord, we pray for ourselves, perhaps selfishly, we pray for those who are struggling with work, struggling to make ends meet, struggling in relationships, struggling with addiction. We pray, O oh Lord, for courage and for strength, for comfort. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and suffering, and those who have come through surgery. We pray for Don Stewart recovering at home and pray for healing for him and we pray O oh Lord for Pat who will have surgery this week and pray Lord that you would guide the hands of the surgeon and that you would bring her safely through and heal her body strengthen her for the battle ahead O oh Lord we bring all these prayers and petitions in your son's name Jesus who taught us to pray together saying our father who art in heaven Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
remembering the words of our Lord Jesus that it is more blessed to give than to receive, let us return to God the offerings of our life and labor. Please be seated. Before you close your eyes to sleep, I have one promise still to keep as I hold you.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. It is through your goodness that we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. 
As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. springtime and harvest sun moon and stars with their courses above join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and love great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, great. 